You're listening to the Holistic Nootropics Podcast, your home for holistic, evidence-based cognitive enhancement strategies. And now your host, Eric Levi. What is going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Holistic Nootropics Podcast, where we discuss using nootropics, biohacking, and nutrition to help you boost your cognition. My name is Eric, and if it is your first time here checking out the podcast, then please take a moment and remember to subscribe. If you are enjoying the podcast as it goes along, which you will no doubt do, then head on over to Apple Podcasts, leave the podcast a five-star review. And if you're listening to this on YouTube, then give it a big like. If anything pops in your mind, questions, comments, critiques, concerns, leave those down in the comment section below, and I will do my best to address all of those as they come. And if you are someone who is looking for the best quality supplement and nootropic products on the market today, then head on over to holisticnootropics.com and download a copy of my free supplement buying guide. This is a fully comprehensive guide that will walk you through ingredient by ingredient on how to find the best quality supplements and nootropics on the market today. Because I don't know if you knew this, the supplement industry is a $100 billion industry, and most of it is absolute trash. There's a lot of shysters in the industry. A lot of people try to make a quick buck and they're selling stuff that's not really up to par. In fact, I recently read that um, they've tested this longevity supplement, NMN, and they real they, they discovered that most NMN supplements don't even have NMN in them. This is the same thing with vitamin D, magnesium supplements. Most supplements on the market just don't even like go and have the stuff in them they say is in them. And on top of that, they fill them with all kinds of toxic preservatives and fillers and excipients and oils and food colorings. Either way, if you are looking for the best quality supplements, I will teach you how to do that. And you get that guide for free over at the homepage at holisticnootropics.com. And you can search around the website and I've got all kinds of articles to help you find all the best supplements, nootropics, and biohacking products for your needs. Okay, let's jump into the podcast today with my guest, Dr. Nawaz Habib. Dr. Habib is the founder of Health Upgraded, an online functional health optimiz uh, optimization clinic and the host of the Health Upgrade podcast. He works with high-performing professionals, athletes, and entrepreneurs to dig deeper and find the root causes of what is holding back their health. He works with those who want to upgrade their health, allowing them to have a greater impact and serve more people. Dr. Habib's book, Activate Your Vagus Nerve, is a simple uh, simple follow, uh, follow guide to help you identify and address a major missing piece in patients dealing with chronic health concerns such as anxiety and depression. By activating the vagus nerve, which we're going to talk a lot about today, he teaches us how we can optimize our productivity, focus, and energy levels, allowing us to experience the effects of upgraded health. Dr. Nawaz Habib, welcome to the Holistic Nootropics Podcast. I'm so excited to be here, Eric. Yeah, this is so cool. Like um, the vagus nerve, you know, this is like one of those real kind of geeky health things that not a lot of people know about. But once you once you uncover what this is all about, man, it just takes your whole health situation to another level. And you know, I know a couple guys, girls, I know a couple health professionals that are talking about it, but it's not mainstream. It's not the keto diet. It's not paleo. It's not CrossFit. It's kind of one of these things that you just you got to dig deep and, and look for professionals like you talking about this stuff. So I want to get into the vagus nerve and, and the parasympathetic nervous system and all that stuff. But before we do, um, I'd love to know your story. I know you're a doctor of chiropractic. You do functional medicine. So what was your aha moment that got you into this kind of alternative health space? Yeah, it's a great question. And just like most other practitioners that have gotten into this functional alternative kind of health space, uh, I had my own health issues and my own health journey. So I uh, I'm a chiropractor by profession. And when I was in chiropractic college, I actually had a um, really, really terrible kind of health struggle going on on my own. I weighed 250 pounds. I had high blood pressure. I was borderline diabetic. This was in my 20s. And I'm learning about health. I'm learning about becoming a doctor and sharing this health information with my clients. And yet I'm not really living it myself. And the aha moment really happened uh, once I got out of school and I was able to connect with uh, a couple of really amazing people, the first one was 
uh, Sachin Patel, a mentor of mine, a really, really wonderful gentleman in the space of functional medicine, a chiropractor himself, but he introduced me to this whole concept of health. He uh, introduced me to this idea of what it truly meant to be healthy and the functional medicine approach to that, really looking at that root cause. In doing so, he prompted me and I was able to kind of get into the space. And that's the moment that I ended up kind of looking back on as the one that helped me lose 75 pounds, get over a lot of my other health struggles, really optimize my functioning. And by far the biggest shift that occurred for me was my energy shift, really, really turning on my ability to uh, wake up in the morning and really just feel energized and ready to take on every day. I was excited to really get to work. And that It took a while, obviously, for that to occur, but it wasn't like I was actively trying to lose weight by any means. I was just learning to be healthier on a day-to-day -day basis. My patients started to notice big shifts. My family started to notice big shifts in me, but also I started to bring those tools to my, uh, to my family, to my patients, to the people that were around me. And the second person, the second kind of prompt that really uh, was, was big for me was meeting my wife. And when I met my wife, it was uh, this amazing moment where obviously two people that just knew they needed to be together forever, but we got into this idea of being healthy together and sharing that health with our kids because we wanted to break a cycle of negative health issues that our families had that we wanted to share with our kids, uh, how to be healthy, how to live in a healthier space, how to really truly show up every single day of their lives. And so those are the two kind of defining moments of uh, becoming who I am and, and going down this fun path. I love it. So much, so many interesting little nuggets there that I'd love to just kind of dig into because what you hit on is what really at the end of the day, this podcast and my channel and my blog, everything that I like I stand for as a as a whole as a health person um, it is what you said. It's not about losing weight. It's about it's about being healthy. It's about feeling good. It's about waking up and just having that that zest, like that that fire. You know, like I, I always say, like you want to feel in the morning like you just got shot out of a cannon. You know, like most mornings. I'm I like I jump out of bed. It's like my brain is like, let's go, and we jump out. Now, granted, I have those mornings, plenty of mornings, where I sit there and I twiddle my thumbs and I pick my belly button, you know, and I'm like, I don't know, I try to go back to sleep, I don't really do it. And then I'm like, okay, let's get after it, you know. After enough belly button picks, you're like, I guess we'll get this thing going, you know. But really, you want to like the morning is that's when your cortisol is juiced. That's when you're just feeling great. Maybe you, you toss a little, you know, coffee or some kind of stimulant or maybe you don't even need that who cares right but 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 we we have to stop this obsession with the scale you know because it's it's this weird number that we put so much you know emphasis on to be like the scale says this so i'm either healthy or unhealthy and what people don't realize is there's so much that goes into metabolic rate and fat loss and all of these things that that really complicate that number so much like you can go up a couple pounds one day, you can go down a couple pounds one day. And it doesn't really reflect like, what did you feel good yesterday? Did you accomplish everything you need to accomplish? Like you said, did you show up for your family? Did you show up for your profession? Did you get 1% better? Like all of these things mean so much more than what the dumb scale says, you know? So, uh, so I am so happy that, that you, people like you have that perspective. Yeah, it's, it's a really important perspective to have. And it's something that a lot of people struggle with because it's almost like there's this limit stuck to the number that they see and that if they don't see the number that they want to see on there that they can't get past that number that they can't feel what their body's trying to tell them about and and really be able to show up uh sure maybe you're a few pounds overweight but really are you able to do what you want to do on a daily basis do the people around you that need you are, are you showing up for them and that's that's what's been the biggest prompt for me to continue on as i have been and somebody who, you know, like you went to, you went to medical school, you know, like you, you went to school to become a chiropractic doctor. Um, so you went to, you went to chiropractor school, um, close enough to medical school. Uh, in fact, um, there's a lot more chiropractors I would take health advice from than from, you know, people who, doctors who went to medical school, especially doctors who want to like take a knife and cut me open. You know, I would much rather like 
I've talked to way more chiropractors who are like, well, hey, you know, why don't we, why don't we fix your alignment here? Why don't we work on this, this, you know, posture? Maybe we have a little uh, vitamin deficiency, whatever it is. Like, I like that way more than, oh, we got to take out your gallbladder. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. is there a way to fix that? Nah, nah. You, you know what's great? You don't even need your gallbladder and that thing in your throat, the thyroid. You don't even really need. I don't know why it's there. It's like totally like a mistake. They put it in there, like evolution, like it's such baloney. Like, let's just take all that stuff out. Your heart, nah, we could replace that. Your kidney, ah, you can go with one of those, whatever. It's it's a really sad state of uh, affairs that we are living in. And the fact that we we go beyond this idea of intelligent design, that, that we know better than nature, that's yeah, crazy to me. And so I I very much follow this idea, this, this entire opinion that... Um, let's look for why the problem is happening rather than cut out the source of the problem, right? Mm -hmm. Like I've, I have countless patients, so many that I can't even like count them on two hands that have had an organ removed for, for what I would say, almost no reason, mm -hmm. especially gallbladders, right? Like the, these are, they're there for a reason. And, and just because you, and I'm, I'm just, clearly projecting here on, on a couple of medical doctors that I've had. Yeah, go for with. it. But just because you don't know what that reason is, doesn't mean that it doesn't have a reason, right? And mm -hmm. just because you're not willing to put in the work and the effort of teaching your patient how to address why the problem happened in the first place, doesn't mean that they're not willing to do so. So that's why I'm here to help empower people to help figure out why those problems are happening in the first place, really address the root cause. And if we can address that root cause naturally and really shift your, your body to function in a much better state, you're going to be able to show up. You're going to have better executive function. You're going to have less inflammation. You're going to be able to function at, as a human being is supposed to function, not like what we see on TV and radio and on the news and all these things, not like we see in the movies. We want to be able to function at, at peak performance, at peak levels. And that's really what, what, creating optimal humans is all about. And that's what people I think are, are really missing from the formula is, you know, we have this obsession with at constantly adding stuff, you know, or like full on taking stuff away, like, for instance, cutting out organs, you know, um, but this obsession of like, I don't feel good. So I need a pill or I need a supplement. And this is why I love you know, functional medicine and uh, naturopathic medicine, because it's all about root cause stuff. It's all about, well, hey, you know, your hip bones connected to your thigh bones, connected to your ankle bone. So like, if you have a pain in your neck, we could get after the neck, but there might also be problems with your hip. There might also be problems with your, this, this could go all the way down to your foot, you know? And it's the same thing in your, in your body, right? Like if there's something, if you feel depressed, okay, well, yeah, your doctor gave you an antidepressant or you heard online, you read something that said, well, you should take N-acetyl-L-tyrosine or you should take 5-HTP. Okay, maybe that might be the Band-Aid, but there is something more sinister going on in your body that you really need to address. And, you know, a lot of times with something like that, it's gut related, it's blood sugar related. Um, it's even, you know, environmental toxin or mold related. So, you know, it takes a professional takes functional medicine to get after that and and really help a patient be patient with that because when they don't get the instant results or if they have like a herxheimer reaction and they start to feel worse you have to really like be there with them and let them know like look it took you years to get here you're not going to figure it out in a week so yeah. you have to you have to work through this no question about it and that's that's really what drew me to functional medicine is this idea of empowering people to really take back control and the fact that we currently live in a time that is, is truly unprecedented, and we'll say this about every single time period that we've been in, but research and, and science and the ability to study what's truly going on within somebody's body has never been what it is today. And it'll continue to improve as we go. And wisdom has never been as wise as it is today as well, right? The old world learnings of traditional Chinese medicine and Ayurvedic medicine and uh, Mediterranean medicine, these are, these are things that have been around and proven for generations and generations. And if we can start to marry these two together, that's basically what functional medicine has done, where we use new age science in the form of getting to that root cause, understanding the testing, taking in the information from the patient saying, okay, these are your symptoms. Let's do some testing to figure out what's going on with your microbiome. Let's go figure out 
if you are actually burning through all of that tyrosine and 5-HTP and you need some support on the serotonin or on the dopamine side, right? Like, like, like let's figure out why that problem is happening. And if we can then go and address that microbiome issue using the right probiotics or using the right herbal remedies to help eliminate the problematic stuff that's going on there. And these are old world things that have been there. We marry these two things together. I've had hundreds of patients that have had amazing, amazing changes to autoimmune conditions, digestive dysfunction, metabolic dysfunction, challenges that have been holding them back have basically been eliminated without the use of medication, without the use of surgery, when we can avoid it. Yes, there is absolutely a time and a place for medicine, especially in an acute scenario, but chronic conditions, medicine has proven time and time again that it doesn't truly know how to handle them. Mm -hmm. I agree. And I I come off as very like anti-medicine for the record, for the record, for everybody listening, I'm very pro-medicine. But I don't think it should be used, like you said, chronically. You know, we put people on statins from the time they're in their 60s to the rest of their life. I don't think that's how that drug is supposed to be used. Same thing with antidepressants. I don't think that's how that's supposed to be. You're not supposed to be on, you know, an antidepressant um, or an anxiolytic um, for 10, 15 years, you know, and constantly getting switched one, switched out, getting a new one, getting a replacement. And then you try to take someone off one. You have these, you know, withdrawals. Um To the point of the gut microbiome, I thought of this while you were talking, but I can't help just just knowing what I know now, just being out in public and looking at people, especially when I see people, you know, like if I go to Costco and I look at the food court, people are eating hot dogs and drinking. So I, I can't help but think how wrecked these people's guts are and how much they must be suffering. Like you can't look at it, you can't see from the outside, but just knowing what we know about the connection of diet to these conditions, the amount of people walking around with some level of IBS, you know, or, or, or some gastrointestinal, uh, gastrointestinal distress, or at the very least acid reflux and GERD, which can just totally wreck your life. Um, And then letting that translate into the chronic condition of autoimmune disorder. So now they've got skin issues. They've got um, you know, hypothyroidism, whatever it is, um, rheumatoid arthritis, whatever it is, uh, MS in a lot of cases, right? Um, it, it, like we, there's just so many people who just they, they, they. It's not that they're, it's not that they're dumb or they're like intentionally doing the wrong thing. It's just that they're not being told by their doctor, like, hey, you know, like, just gonna put it out there, the hot dog and the scale, like the scale isn't your biggest concern with the hot dog. Okay, that thing on your hand, that twitch that you get, that that insomnia that you have, that 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 gastrointestinal stress that you feel, like that's what you really want to address. Yeah, yeah, it really does come down to not necessarily these data points that we see on the scale that we see even on our aura rings or whatever tools we're using. The data points are there to help drive empowerment and change. And really what we need to become aware of is what's going on within our body. How are we truly feeling? We've been so desensitized to understanding what's going on within our body and been basically given this this thought process, this mindset that we don't know what's best for us, that the doctor knows what's best for us. I was watching this show the other day. I have two daughters now. One is four and one is one. And Peppa Pig often finds its way on TV and Peppa Pig had this instance where uh, one of, I think it was the daddy pig got sick or something along those lines. And he he had a sneeze, like he was just sniffling, like it was not a big deal. He needed some very basic remedies to help support him. And the immediate reaction on the TV show was, oh no, you have sniffles, I'm calling Dr. Brown Bear. And Dr. Brown Bear was called to come and see what's going on with this dad who has sniffles we're being trained, we're being entrained from a very young age to really see that we are not in power of, Mm -hmm. uh, that we're not in control of our health, that we can't be responsible for how we feel. And so it's not a coincidence that at this point, the answer is always quote unquote, come from the doctor, right? We, whatever the doctor says I have to do is, is this entrained belief. Really what needs to happen is we need to relearn that we matter that our thoughts, that our feelings, that our awareness of what's happening within our body is truly what's going to drive that positive change. 
And that's how we can help make those decisions and really uh, move forward and get better. Yeah, I'm so happy you said that. I think about that all the time. I think about just in so many instances, just how, like you said, we've been trained to not trust our own instincts, to just to just lose complete or give up complete control of our health to other people. Now, granted, health is complicated, right? Like who has time to understand metabolism? Who has time to understand the uh, uh, the immune system, right? I get it. And, you know, when you feel sick, if you're a professional, you got kids, you got all kinds of things going on. Yes, like you want to go to the doctor, you want somebody to help you, right? But um, so many doctor's visits are for things that if you just had, like if somebody had just given you just a little bit of information, you could probably avoid all that together. You know, like the the flu and the cold, the sniffles, like people do go to the doctor for the sniffles, right? People do go to the doctor for the sweats, you know, and for chills and for the common cold. And what do they get? They get antibiotics. You know, it's because antibiotics are, um, there's a stat on the CDC's website. I believe it's 70% of antibiotics prescribed are to- totally inappropriate. So even the CDC, for as corrupt as that organization is, even they know that, you know? So it's like people, but that's what people want. They just want to go to the doctor and get the antibiotics. When in fact, what they what they probably should be recognizing is, hey, there are other aspects of the immune system that, that people aren't telling you. And this will probably take us into the vagus nerve, right? And to the nervous system, um, into why that's all connected. What, why is your nervous system connected to your immune system? Why is your, why are you getting, why, why are those people who every time you look at them, like when I used to work in an office, there was always that person. They were just always sick. They always had the box of tissues next to the desk. They ran out, they ran through all their sick days. They have to come into work, you know, constantly sick, constantly blowing their nose, sneezing. How was your weekend? Ah, oh, I just laid in bed all weekend. It felt terrible. You know, Hey, how's your, you know, what are you gonna do tonight? Oh, I'm just going to stay in. I feel awful. You know, what is that deal? What is the connection with all that? It's a really great question and a really great point here. We often think of the brain, the nervous system, the, uh, these organs in particular to be one of control and and of um, signaling, basically, right? Nerve, uh, the brain has neurons in it. And that's, of course, true. But did you know that 70% of the cells within the brain and nervous system are immune cells? They're micro, microglial cells, they're astrocytes, they're the ones that are cleaning up the mess of the inflammatory challenges that are coming in. Those cells are the ones that are, are really doing the work here. Those are, so by, by volume, by simple numbers, The brain is actually an immune organ, not a nervous system organ, which is crazy to think. Mm. But really, there is a really important factor here. We need signaling. We need information to get from one place to another. We need that control system of our brain to send and receive signals from around our body. And this is why I talk about awareness of what's going on within our body and being able to share that information between different areas. And so the control, the the really important thing to understand is just like a car and and if I'm going to simplify it as simple as we possibly can a car has generally an accelerator and a brake two separate pedals we want to go forward or we want to slow down right those are basically if we if we hyper simplify the human body we're either turning on a certain area of our brain or we're turning it down and we're turning on an organ or we're turning it off right and that's going to happen hundreds of thousands of times every second within our body The control of that has to do with the state around us, the environment, what challenges we're experiencing. Are we in a state of stress or are we in a state of rest and digest and relaxation? What's going on around us? Are we eating in front of our desk where we're in a stressed state? Uh, Our boss is around the corner and we've got chaos going on around us, kids screaming behind us. A lot of us have been on Zoom for the last couple of years. What what state is your body in? And our body is always going to be responding accordingly. If we're sitting in a stressed state way too much, then we're not able to turn on certain areas and we're not able to turn off certain areas. The most important one of which is inflammation. If if we're under stress, inflammation levels go up and we're not able to bring that inflammation level down. When we're in a state of rest and digest and recovery, that information, that inflammation can actually be suppressed, decreased, and that is done specifically through one of the functions of the vagus nerve. It's called the cholinergic anti-inflammatory system. 
This is a system that is controlled through the vagus nerves neurotransmitter control of acetylcholine spread to all of the organs that the vagus nerve touches. Now, how many organs could the vagus nerve touch? Well, in reality, no other nerve does anything like the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve is our 10th cranial nerve. We have 12 pairs of cranial nerves, and this one comes out from our brainstem. We have one on each side. It passes down beside your carotid artery and jugular vein, by the way, through your neck. It sends a branch to your ear. We'll talk about that in a second. It sends branches to the muscles in the throat, the pharynx and the laryngeal muscles. And then it comes down, it actually innervates the heart, the lungs, the stomach, the spleen, the kidneys, liver, pancreas, gallbladder, small intestine, large intestine. I might have missed something in there. It essentially touches every single organ. There is a connecting point between the vagus nerve and essentially every organ within our body. The vagus nerve is the only nerve that does anything like this within our body. And that's why it's so important. It is that brake control, turning on the brakes or pushing that brake pedal to help slow down the inflammatory processes that are happening within our body. Those inflammatory processes happen when we're in a sympathetic fight or flight state. And if we're in that state too much, like most of us are living on a day-to-day -day basis, we're not able to turn on that brake. Okay, so I, I love that analogy because it, it's so apropos to really kind of highlight the difference between the sympathetic, parasympathetic, and it's it's your hypothalamus, right? Your hypothalamus is like the sensor that's kind of feeling your environment. It knows exactly like is there. I I love how we still like compare everything to like when we were cavemen and cave women, you know, like our Paleolithic answers. Like it's a it's a tiger chasing you or whatever, right? And it it's like today it's like that tiger chasing us is, um, you know, we we look at our phone bill or something, you know, or we're in a fight on Facebook or whatever, um, and. Sure, like a little bit of that is you need that. I think I think people really confuse this kind of idea of stress hormones, and we should have no stress hormones, so we should always be in parasympathetic. And it's I don't think that's true. I think we should be. You should be obviously be able to react appropriately to situations, and in the 21st century, you're just going to have more of the situations pop up, but. I think the point is that you have to do everything you can to protect your parasympathetic state and be there like consciously as much as possible so that when you do need that sympathetic, you you have it to work. The problem is, is that people are in this low level of fight or flight all day, every day. And this is why you see so many cases of anxiety. Like people are just constantly trying to keep up with what is the, th what is the newest thing today that's going to make us panic? You know, what is in my life causing panic? What is this thing? And then we start just losing it with every little thing around us. And before you know it, that reserve of stress hormones is gone. And now this is when inflammation starts to run rampant because cortisol is an anti-inflammatory, is it not? So you need it for that purpose. Cortisol uncontrolled becomes inflammatory, but it, it does, it's required to be, uh, you, you do need to be able to shift between these two states and both states are absolutely required. The problem is we're spending way too much time on that sympathetic stress dominant side. And to your point, I just want to kind of add to it that there are four types of stressors that we are all experiencing at any given time. And these are the ones that I, I break down with every single one of my clients. We have biochemical stress. These are the things that are around us in our environment, the air that we're breathing. If we're indoors all day, we know indoor air quality is worse. Get outside. That'll make a big difference. Spend some time in, in nature, get some fresh air. That'll make a huge change. Biochemical stress also comes from our food that we're eating. Are we choosing really heavily inflammatory foods like a Costco food court? Or are we choosing grass-fed, clean, green, organic vegetables and, and choices that are going to help reduce that inflammatory reaction? That choice makes a huge difference on that biochemical stress. Plastics, things that we're, we're using that are around us, all of those are, are interacting with us and creating a level of stress. And so we have to do our best to minimize that level of stress. Second one is physical stress. That's a movement thing. I don't know if people are watching this. If you're not watching, if you're just listening to the podcast, I'm standing right now. And so standing up and moving and being in a, in a mobile state where you were not sitting for 10, 12, 14 hours a day 
and then laying down in bed, we're, we need to be active and we know the positive effects of good exercise. And exercise is a really great point to the idea of knowing how to handle and be, be in stress for a period of time. We know exercise is a hermetic stressor. These mild controlled stressors allow us to respond when there's some sort of other stressor that pops up because our body has trained for that moment. Hermetic stressors keep us in this ability to shift between sympathetic and parasympathetic, being able to shift back into that state and learn how to come back to that recovery opportunity afterwards. But physical stress has a lot to do with movement, muscles, muscle capacity, the ability to move, flexibility, all of those things. And then the other two have a lot to do with kind of that emotional side to things. The emotional side we're looking at is uh, emotional stressors that are things that are happening on a day-to-day -day basis. What's the new thing on the news? There's a new war going on. There's a new virus going out. There's like mask mandates for this age group. And my kid is having this fight with that person. And the day-to-day -day kind of stressors that are going to come up, how are we handling those? And yes, there will be days with significant stress and there will be days that there's less. But those emotional stressors are the day-to-day -day things like looking at your bills, for example. And then there's a psychological stressor. So things that have happened in our past, traumatic incidents, uh, childhood traumas, things that we might not have realized that are affecting our overall ability to function, those are actually creating stressors all the time. I like to liken it to the idea of the lenses through which we see the world. And if there's certain scratches in certain areas, it's really difficult to see past that area, right? It's a very blurry thing. And so it actually creates a mindset or a shift and these are some of those stressors similar to the idea of being entrained from being a kid that when you have the sniffles, you've got to go see the doctor because you don't know what's wrong. You can't self figure out and be aware of what the challenges are and what you need to do for yourself. These are some of those scratches that we see. And this can go as far as like significant, like I've had patients that have had sexual trauma when they were kids or been assaulted in certain ways or been mugged by people on the street. Like these are these are going to create those scratches on the lens through which you see the world. And so those can be stressors because when those instances are brought back through an emotional stress or some sort of incident, we experience that stress over again. So we have to look into all four of these, the emotional, the psychological, the biochemical, and the physical stressors. All of those, when uncontrolled, will shift us to that sympathetic state and turn on that fight or flight. What we need to be able to do is learn how do we turn us back into that parasympathetic state that is controlled through the vagus nerve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that you couldn't have said it better. I mean, all of that stuff is we talk about that all the time here. It's not just it's not just like work stress, and that's your whole thing. It's it's everything. Like we do, like we 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 focus so much on our emotional stress, but then we forget this whole other side of the biochemical stress, which is, yeah, what's, what's in our environment. You know, you might have a diet that's locked down and you could live in a moldy house, right? Um, you, you might be like people microwaving their lunch in plastic containers, you know, or eating like those, uh, microwave dinners and you, you heat it up in plastic. And it's like, you don't realize like this kind of low level of, of plastic you're taking is very inflammatory to the body. Or if you're eating some food and it's got these food colorings in it, or, you know, um, heated exposed hydrogenated oils, um, omega sixes, all of these things are highly, highly inflammatory. And yeah, you might be doing everything. You might be doing meditation. You might be working out. You might have a, a you know, you hang out with your best friend all the time. You got a girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever it is, but then you, your, your diet isn't locked down like that. And so, you know, and that's, I think a lot about like, again, going back to the weight loss thing, why weight loss is so it's like the worst thing to focus on because you eat those Weight Watchers foods and they all, they're all they all microwave dinners. You know, you're heating them up in plastic. They've got artificial food colorings and they're highly processed, which means they've got highly inflammatory compounds in them. And you're taking that in and you don't realize that the inflammation is actually keeping the fat on you because that's your body's own defense mechanism. So you're, you're, you're stressing out your body and then you're causing extra inflammation and you're not losing the weight. You think you're eating less calories and or you, you are eating less calories and you think that's going to help you lose weight. But what you're really doing is you're causing all these other problems. And it all goes back to the vagus nerve, right? Because the vagus nerve is picking this all up and sending it back to the brain. And the brain is going, oh, you know, uh, adrenal corticoids, right? Got to get those things popping, you know, got to get that cortisol, got to get that norepinephrine or epinephrine, got to get it all out there, right? Got to cut, cut off the acetylcholine 
send all the stress hormones to the muscles because we're under attack by plastics, food colorings, omega sixes, mold, you know, BPA, all this stuff, right? Yeah, that's absolutely correct. And and it really uh, to to further onto this point, and and it's true, like the parasympathetic system, nervous system by a vast majority is run through the vagus nerve. There are a few other nerves that do some stuff, uh, primarily sacrococcygeal nerves, but uh, the vast majority of parasympathetic is run through the vagus nerve. That said, only 15% of the information on the vagus nerve is parasympathetic in nature, which is crazy to think. 15%, one five. So there's still 85% of other information that's flowing through this really important nerve. What could that possibly be? And this is where it comes down to that awareness piece. 80% of the information within our vagus nerve is actually afferent information. It's the information of what's going on within the body. It's like this thermostat type of information, checking what's going on with my microbiome, what's going on with my stomach acid, what's going on with my liver detoxification, pancreatic uh, enzymes, what's going on with my spleen and kidneys and their filtration, what's going on with my lungs and my heart and all that information is going up to the brain. It's going up to the brainstem, to the hypothalamus. This is where that control of survival and understanding what's going on. And then this is where that awareness piece comes in, where we can actually start to use executive function to think about, hey, how am I feeling? What's going on internally? That's where the real nuts and bolts of the importance of the vagus nerve really comes down to. If we can empower people to listen to what their body is saying, how they're feeling, the things that they're experiencing, hey, do I have a little bit of burning here after I ate that? Or what's going on with, uh, do I have a little bit of pain on my right shoulder because it might be a gallbladder type of thing that's going on? These are early signs. These are the little whispers that we need to start to listen to that if we don't listen, soon enough will become screams that our body is yelling at us. And that's when we go to the doctor and then they're like, oh, cut out your gallbladder. Because mm -hmm. we miss those early signs that our body is doing something and trying to address something and needs our attention to do better with. Mm -hmm. Man, oh, that's so interesting. 85% is, is, is unparasympathetic stuff. So it's like, this is the interesting part about the negative bias, right? Because it takes so much work to, to be happy. You know, you can't just, you, once you get there, it's being happy is very easy, being like just kind of content. And like you said, like getting out of bed and feeling great, showing up, all that's like, it, it's almost seamless, but like to get to that point, because you are fighting an uphill battle physically with your body, because your body just wants to react to everything going on. And because there's so much stuff going on, it's like, well, we got, hold on a second. We can't be happy. We have to worry about this you know, all of these chemicals, we got to worry about these food colorings, we got to worry about the war, we got to worry about all the, you know, the people, what about the people talking about us? What about all those people on Facebook? You know, like, what about my how many likes did I get? You know, like, what about my family? I haven't talked to them. Is my mom? Okay? Is my dad? Okay? Is my kids? Okay? Right? So it's like, your body's just feelings for so many reasons to panic. And you have to use that vagus nerve to your advantage. You have to, you know, that's why it's important to have like these mindfulness practices because that's literally the way that you that you overpower your nervous system to, uh, you know, to, to keep you healthy. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely right. And um, it's it's that awareness piece. It's that ability to shift into that rest and rest and digest state. And this is what's truly. Um, I've added one more word to this. The parasympathetic nervous system, the vagus nerve, is kind of known through the conventional system, through most practitioners, as a rest and digest system. Um, I also want to add in recovery, and that's really huge because we can't recover when we're under stress. We can't turn on that cholinergic anti-inflammatory system and, and slowly shut down the excess inflammatory challenges that are going on. We need an appropriate amount of inflammation, but when we have too much, it becomes more of a problem. And that's where diseases tend to occur. We need recovery to occur. That recovery primarily occurs during sleep. This is when the vagus nerve is most active. I call sleep the gym for the vagus nerve. It's where it goes to work out, really do its work. And that's why it's really important if you wanna really get into this to understand what your vagus nerve is doing, the prime tool to tell us how we're doing is our heart rate variability. That's the direct sign of how strong our vagus nerve is. Higher heart rate variability 
is a direct sign of higher vagus nerve function, better vagus nerve function, better vagus nerve tone, better control of inflammation, higher recovery. That's why on days when your HRV is a little bit higher, this is very common with athletes. If your HRV is higher, you're going to push yourself that day. You want high HRV on game day and you want to be able to recover afterwards. You're often going to have much lower HRV after you've pushed yourself. So you give yourself time to recover when necessary. And so this is a really important factor to tell us about our ability to really truly control the inflammatory challenges that we're going to create, the stressors that we're going to put on ourselves. Are we able to recover from those? And the HRV is a great way to do that. I use an aura ring. Whoop band is another great option. There's a lot of these tools that are coming out that are measuring HRV. Elite, elite HRV is a great uh, simple tool. People, you just put your finger into the thing and it's really easy. But these are great tools that are coming out. This is where new science is really emerging to point out here are some amazing tools that can help us understand what's going on within our body. Don't marry yourself to that data, but use it to create positive changes within your overall activities, your habits, your life. Yeah, what I love about the Aura Ring, the HRV I've geeked out on so hard, and there are some really awesome tools that I found have helped um, HRV. The Apollo Neuro Wearable is one of the best um, red light, like light exposure, light therapy, um, you know, getting out in the sun, blue light exposure at the right times of day, limited amounts, just like a nice, like a do like micro dosing the sun, um, <laughs> is awesome. Um, but keeping your circadian rhythm locked yeah. down, you know, I think that's, that's really, uh, that's been a huge game changer. And again, it goes back to the freaking scale, right? Like your HRV means so much will affect you so much more than the number on the scale. And the HRV will actually give you a better number on the scale because when you recover, all of your metabolism shoots up, you know, your body is much more efficient. You're, sh you're shooting out less, um, you know, like, uh, what is it like leptin and ghrelin and your, you know, your, your fat stores are under control. Um, the HRV and then the heart rate too, because, you know, you want your heart rate when you sleep to go down. Cause I know when I wear my aura, if my heart rate doesn't go down, like if I drink that night or, um, you know, if I eat too late or if I have a, you know, an argument with my wife or something before I go to bed, whatever it is, it's like, that thing does not go down. It says you're not as recovered today. So, um, in the biohacking space, we, we focus so much on, um, you know, supplements and wearables and hormones and these cool, like longevity things. But at the end of the day, what is the condition of your heart? What is the condition of your cardiovascular system? What is the condition of your circulatory system? Like how is your blood flowing? Right? Like, and then this of course affects your nerves because are your nerves able to deliver successfully deliver, um, you know, these chemical signals to the, uh, you know, to the, to the tissues, to the organs that they're able to, and, and, uh, is your body circulating blood enough to get oxygen to these tissues so they can even receive the chemical hormones in the first place, right? Um, so the anatomy and physiology side to it, it's really hard to understand. I'm just barely starting to understand it myself, but it's so important. And, and heart rate variability, man, like when you start to really dive into that data, that is the, in my, from my own perspective, like that was probably the biggest game changer um, for really getting into beast mode health for me. I think if there's any single number that'll that'll really shift your ability to show up on a day-to-day -day basis and tell you um, what once you learn how your body feels on days when your HRV is good versus bad and when when you can start to like I can guess my HRV basically for the entire night within five minutes of waking up almost every morning and, and within a, a couple of points I can tell you now when I wake up and I'm really groggy, I can tell you my HRV is going to be lower, that I didn't sleep well, my heart rate stayed up, I ate late, something along those lines, right? The I can feel what's going on now. So having the tool is still phenomenal. It still gives me this really important feedback mechanism. But in reality, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how I feel on my own. I literally haven't checked my readiness score my HRV for last night, but I can tell you it was pretty good, right? Based on years and years of feedback from using tools like this. But th if there's any single number that can help you get into that sense of awareness, that'll do um, the job that you really truly want it to do. HRV without a doubt is the best number. Yeah. Um, the best HRV. Do, do you have a story about the best HRV that you've ever had? 
Like yeah. when you oh, saw man. Um, I swear, I, I was on vacation, so pretty uh, easy, very low stress day. Walked outside, sun, no cell phone, no no tech. Like it was, it was a beautiful day in uh, Punta Cana, mm. Dominican, and uh, I, I went to sleep and I woke up and I think it was like thirty points higher than uh, any other t- day that I've ever had. I think it was that's in awesome. Eighties or nineties, somewhere there. Um, it was a phenomenal, phenomenal day. So it, it just goes to show what like a calming, restful, recovery-based day where you go to sleep at a good time, you wake up at a good time, you follow that circadian rhythm, you follow that sunlight pattern, what it'll actually do to your biology and actually shift the bio- biochemical changes within your body to optimize your function. The best HRV I've ever had, I know you didn't ask, but I, like this is the, just the craziest thing. The best HRV I ever had was, I mean, just just bonkers high. Like we're talking like Putacana, you know, vacation, yes. like no, but this level was the day or like the couple of days after I recovered from COVID. Mm. I had COVID and it like tanked me, right? Um, my, te- my body temperature on the oar ring, I think it was like five degrees higher. I mean, it was insane. Like all of those metrics are, were just crazy. But then like for the next week after I recovered from it, I'm talking like HRV in the 90s average wow. in the hundreds and my 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 average is like 50s 60s you know yeah. it was and I and the only thing I was like trying to put the story together and it was like okay I got sick and my body like fought it off like it fought vehemently like it went to war it was like you know Spartan right totally. and then after that it was like all right dude we're going on vacation and my immune system just chilled out and yeah. everything, my whole body just was like, all right, we're just, we're just chilling. And it was just insane. I never, I'd never seen numbers like that. I, I've had a few days where my numbers were, were quite high, but never yeah. like I had when I had like the days after I recovered from COVID. What a phenomenal feeling. And, and like, we can get into the whole political side of this, but it's very clear that if you, and there's actually some really cool research studies on there. Um, HRV is a direct sign. If higher HRV is, is correlated to quicker recovery from COVID, directly lo- uh, related. Really, really cool research studies that have been done. Small sample study size, but there, there are a couple of studies coming out on this. And there's actually, because you brought up COVID, all these research studies are going through my mind. It's, it's um, people that are suffering from long COVID 90% of them have some sort of vagus nerve dysfunction, some sort mm-hmm. of inflammatory issue. Even there's, I believe 30% of cases had an enlarged vagus nerve, like actually physically enlarged space in their vagus nerve. Wow. These are people that were dealing with some sort of gut dysfunction or inflammatory condition, and they either had plaques or some sort of parasite that was addressing or creating inflammatory challenges within the nerve directly. And mm-hmm. so ab- your ability to handle the, the stressor of COVID in itself is obviously then going to be decreased. Now you're a COVID long hauler. Now you're dealing with these issues, this inflammatory uh, lack of control, this immune system dysregulation because your vagus nerve is not working well. Wow, man. Oh, th- I don't know a lot about long COVID. I just know that I hear it and, um, yeah. you know, you hear these stories about like brain fog and and I definitely had like, I didn't have long haul COVID, but I like I recovered from it. And then it took about it took it took a week for me to get like my my smell back and my taste back. And then it took like another week while I still had like, some weird. And then I had like a month of just kind of just random stuff that like weird stomach cramps. Um, but then then I, I got over it, fully recovered, whatever. I didn't take any medications. I just I just upped my like certain um supplements and that sort of I'm not here to tell anybody how to recover from COVID um by any means, but um uh, I recently partnered with this program called um, Dynam- uh, Dynamic Neural Retraining Systems (DNRS). Yeah, I know um, DNRS. You know, yeah. yeah, this lady um, Annie Hooper. I don't yeah. know her of her that well, but I do know a lot of people have seen some phenomenal results with it. And one of the things that they are doing now is they're doing long COVID. Um, mm-hmm. They're helping people with their long COVID, and this is just all like online, um, you know, I don't know the exact exercises they do, so I can't speak to the physical process, but you know, they, they, they work with anxiety, depression, they work with trauma, but then they also work with long COVID, which I thought was really interesting. And that goes to your point of what you're talking about, that there must be 
there's obviously a nervous system connection, but you know, to think that it, that specifically you're talking about studies they have found pertaining to the vagus nerve, like we're opening a whole new door here that could really help people get through this if you if you're going at this this way. Exactly, and and if you have a good strong vagus nerve and you practice a lot of these exercises and tools to help make it work better, you're prompting your ability to handle it when you do get it because now we know it's endemic. Everybody at some point is going to be exposed to it. How severe is it going to be? How much is it really going to hit you? It truly is dependent on your state of health from before. Speaking of DNRS, uh, dynamic neural retraining, I have patients that swear by it and it's mm. linked. It, the whole idea behind it is neuroplasticity, is changing the, the uh, signaling structures within your brain simply by thinking about new things when you used to think about older things when you think through normal habits. So the, the circuitry that's been, uh, that naturally has been there is habitual, it's been trained. And dynamic neural retraining is how do we shift instead of going down that negative pathway and coming up and conjuring this negative emotion because of something that happened, what's something positive that could, could occur? And we start going down these new pathways. Neuroplasticity is this tool that we can all use that are really positively shift overall health. It can happen in the case of DNRS with people that are dealing with mental health struggles like anxiety and depression, but it's also really good for helping neuroplasticity in particular. It's amazing as a tool that we can use to help retrain the vagus nerve directly. Mm. So this is something that we can definitely get into chatting about. I'd love to get into this. Neuroplasticity is obviously super interesting, right up my alley. Um, you know, one thing uh, I was thinking about when you're saying that was I just I read this book recently. It's called The Confidence Gap. And um, if you have uh, Amazon, um, if you have Kindle, it comes with like a it comes with the Kindle membership. If you get like the the membership with the all included whatever. Um, so I just read this book, this audio book, and I wasn't expecting much from it, but it was super interesting. And they talk a lot about this. Um, he doesn't obviously go into the detail that you're going to get from like the DNRS program, but he had this very simple exercise that actually I, I, I take that with me every day now, which is retraining your brain to have confidence in situations where you almost kind of self-sabotage yourself out of having confidence. And it's, it, it's like the same pathway that your brain has automatic responses to things. Like for instance, you know, Mary had a little lamb, red, white, and blue, like that sort of thing, right? Like you always are able to, your brain can automatically fill in the gaps, right? That's just kind of how the brain works. Um, but it's also the same thing with confidence. Like when you start to think, you know, um, like, uh, like if you want to go to start going to the gym and you're like, oh, I'm going to go to the gym. And then all of a sudden you have that thought, like, you can't go to the gym, you loser, you're fat, you're ugly, you know, you're lazy, like you have too much stuff to do. That's an automatic response that you've trained yourself into after so many years of just not allowing yourself to be confident, right? So what you do is you start to, when you start to feel that come, then you basically like replace that thought and you you name it, you know, you address it and you're like, Oh no, like what am I? Of course I can go to the gym. Like that's such a stupid thought. Like, yeah, duh. And then you slowly do that throughout your day with all of those thoughts. And then you start to build confidence in that way. Yeah, that that makes so much sense. And it, it's exactly, I believe, what the idea behind DNRS is, the idea behind changing your emotional structures and the habitual thoughts that we come up with. And um just to kind of further that thought a little bit. When we, when we retrain these circuits, we can actually shift the emotional changes that then occur. So, and, and we can prompt ourselves to, to think about things in a slightly different way. So for example, um, I just got back into CrossFit. I had been off it for a couple of years. Every time I go, I talk about, and I, I remember, and I share with the people around me how much stronger I feel having gotten back into it. And I do notice these things, these are positive shifts, but I'm never talking about it as a negative thing. Yeah, my body's sore the next day. Yeah, I've got a little bit of DOMS and I wanna stretch it out and work those things out. But I don't talk about those things. I talk about how much stronger and how much more capable I feel because I'm lifting weights again, right? Like, man, I got, a, I got bench press up to 150 already. This is phenomenal. I feel so strong and I'm telling my spotting partner, I feel so good. And that is training my brain to feel good when I'm there. It's creating this positive mm -hmm. pathway 
simply just being there and experiencing that positive energy. And so every time I go, I feel that positive energy, same idea. And so it becomes easier to get yourself to get up and go to the gym rather than say, no, I don't feel like it. I feel lazy, tired, whatever it is. Yeah. And it's gotta be the same thing with diet too, where it's like you, you, you address that where you're like, I, like, I want to eat when you know, you're not hungry and you're just like, you're just kind of impulsively eating or you're eating like, uh, you know, you're late night eating or whatever. And you know, you're not hungry. You know, if you don't eat, you're not going to starve to death, but yet, but yet you eat. Right. And there's like a little bit of stress in there. There's like a lot of self-doubt. There's a ton of like self-doubt, like, like binge eaters. And I know this because I was one, I still kind of am one, um, you know, late at night, that's when all the demons start flooding in. And if you're up late enough and you, whatever happened in your day, you take it out on a bag of chips or a pint of ice cream or whatever, you know, whatever your, whatever your vice is, it's like, you are going for it and you're not even tasting the food. You're not even like consciously that you're just thinking of all that stuff. And, you know, it's a pattern, you know, it, it, once you do it a few times, now it's a pattern. Now, you know, every night at midnight, I watch this Netflix show and then I hit the freezer. I grab that ice cream. I grab the spoon and I just go for it. I just put myself into a coma. Yeah. And the only way to break that pattern is to consciously have that awareness to front brain's got to overpower back brain. And, um, and then, yeah, like I, I, I'm sure DNRS probably goes into this as far as like how to break that pattern, but yeah. you definitely need that pattern broken so that you can get, cause, cause willpower is just not enough, you know? That's exactly right. Oh man. There's a great book on this called willpower doesn't work. Yeah. Phenomenal, phenomenal book, but it, it's speaking about how you need to create the patterns and create the actual opportunities for success rather than simply rely on willpower to push you through these positive changes all the time. Yeah. So what are some good um, exercises to do to, to help strengthen the vagus nerve, you know, as That's we kind of wrap up question. here? Um, so really what we need to remember with the vagus nerve to be able to turn it on, the, the ability to shift your state comes down to your breath. Your breath truly is the controlling mechanism that you can use to, to go from uh, sympathetic, going fast, like short, shallow breaths to a calm, relaxed, slow exhale, deep diaphragmatic breath. And that'll shift you to parasympathetic. Okay. By doing so, you give the vagus nerve an opportunity to turn on and to do the work that it needs to do. So what I have people do really simply put one hand on your chest, one hand on your belly and take three deep breaths and control your breath and do your best to find out if you're chest hand, the hand that's on your chest is the one that's moving forward and backward, up and down. That tells you that you're in a sympathetic state and you need to shift that breath to one where your belly is the one that's moving because your diaphragm is the one that's actually going up and down. When you're going into these deep breaths, it's really going to help shift that parasympathetic activity and, and turn on the vagus nerve. The other thing that's really important here that you can uh, use to hack this a little bit more is shorter inhales, longer exhales. If you can double the length of your uh, inhale on your exhale, so let's say you wanna do a four second inhale, do an eight second exhale. The slower that exhale is going to be, the more we're gonna turn on vagus nerve because exhales really truly are where the parasympathetic activity gets turned on. The inhale is when the diaphragm comes down. As the diaphragm is coming up, it's creating the stretch and motion pattern within the vagus nerve that actually physically stimulates it, which is really quite cool. So it all really truly comes down to breath. Uh, if you have kids, this is a great one that I do with my four-year-old. We're getting into it eventually. The one-year-old is a little young, but humming before meals is really great. I have a, a moment to sit. Everybody's been running around, riled up. We sit down and we do a bit of hmm. What you're doing is you're stimulating the pharyngeal and laryngeal muscles. These muscles, are innervated by the vagus nerve. And so when we stimulate vibration within those muscles, we're actually stimulating vagus nerve activity. And because it's humming, you're exhaling. And so if you do a long drawn out exhale, it's a combination of breath and the laryngeal muscles getting activated. The laryngeal muscles are the ones that uh, tension the vocal cords. So the reason I have any pitch or tone in my voice, the reason I can go really, really low or really, really high 
is because of my vagus nerve activity to my vocal cords to create tension within them. So this is a really great tool. So singing, chanting, gargling is another really great one. These are really great tools to help stimulate those specific nerves in the uh, neck, the vocal cords, laryngeal and pharyngeal muscles. So those wow. are- Wow, yeah, th that's so cool. I love it. Yeah, I um, breathing exercises is like, it, it changed my life le yeah. legitimately. And I don't like say that lightly, like, 100% changed my life and doing breathing exercises like that, that require longer exhales. I, I like to hold the breath a little bit, um, uh, box breathing, yep. um, alternate nostril breathing. You know, I don't do it so much anymore, but like, I mean, I had six, seven years of like almost every day doing these breathing exercises and man, like they, they change your life because they change your nervous system. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you start to look at the world differently and, Going back to like the binge eating thing, you don't realize it, but and you don't realize it until you start doing these breathing exercises. But when you're like having those anxiety attacks, when you're having those panic attacks, when you're when you're caught up binge eating, when you're caught up in that moment of like, oh, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna get that bottle of, of vodka, or like, man, I'm gonna smoke that joint, or like, man, I gotta like, you know, or when you're kind of in that moment of like, I'm gonna fight somebody, I'm gonna punch a wall, I'm gonna, you know, you start feeling violent, whatever it is, you'll notice your breath is really shallow you notice you're breathing out of your mouth and it's really shallow and it's really fast. And what you do is you, you stop and you take a deep breath through your nose and you do a few of those and then you hold it and then you breathe out longer in, through your nose, um, longer than when you breathe in. And this is like, th no drug can replicate what yeah. you get from that. You know, there no substance can replicate what you get from that. And you center yourself and you ground yourself and then you go, oh, okay. You know, and and again, the binge eating thing, it was like for me, it was clear as day where it's like I'm getting after that ice cream and I'm it's all shallow breathing. And then it's like, yeah. what are we doing right now? Exactly. What, what are we doing? Oh, I feel like yeah. crap. Okay, let's what's put this really thing cool is when we get into that deep breathing, what we're actually doing is we're turning the blood flow to that prefrontal cortex where our executive function goes on. And we can actually reason and logic rather than think about survival and stay in these habits that are going on in the back of our mind when we're shallow breathing and short and shallow breathing. So that, that deep breath, not only does it turn on the vagus nerve, but it actually puts us in a state to think more clearly. Wow. You know, I, I wanted to wrap it up, but I had one more question I thought of while mm -hmm. we were talking about this. What do you think of caffeine? H how does caffeine interact with all this stuff? Because, you know, it's like this, this caffeine, is caffeine good for the vagus nerve? Is it, does it, you know, does it, put you into an automatic fight or flight? Like, is there a way to like kind of relax the vagus nerve after you've gotten yourself wound up with caffeine? What do you think of that? It totally depends on the person. I will say on an individual basis, some people can really handle it. Others can't. General rule of thumb, if you need caffeine in the first hour and a half within waking up, then you're dependent on it. And that's actually going to rile you up. It'll push you into an adrenal overload. It'll actually put you into a sympathetic state more easily. For alertness and awake. A wakefulness, if you can wait at least an hour and a half after waking up to have that coffee and you're not absolutely reliant on that for that boost, then it's a great tool to help with the alertness. Right. And then does it, is it like kind of physiologically stressing your, your HPA axis and then lo lowering your, your parasympathetic tone? Um, it does a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. It will. If we're not reliant on, on a caffeine push to, to, stay alert and awake, then we're able to be in a vagus stimulated state more easily. But it can be used uh, purposefully to shift us into a mild sympathetic zone. The problem is if we're already sympathetic, it'll push us even further. So I like to keep it mm -hmm. close to kind of that center area where we're more parasympathetic. It won't necessarily push us all the way to the edge of being like riled up on, on edge because we're not having our caffeine or something along those lines. Okay. So yeah, yeah. It is, no, it, it's, it's a little iffy, but it depends on kind of where your starting point is. If you need right. that caffeine to get through the day, then it's a, it's a more of a problem and it'll push you into that sympathetic overdrive for sure. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, I try to have a healthy relationship with caffeine um, where it's, it's, I use it more as a nootropic than as like a way to power through my day. Exactly. Um, you know, I feel like I'm in a place where I don't need it, but I like to have it because it does, it does, put a little extra 
um, you know, zest in my morning and, and, you know, people talk about health benefits with it. I don't know about that, but, um, I think, it, I think if you have a healthy relationship with it, but I'm so happy that you said that you kind of prefaced everything with it's very individual because we do know there's enzymes in your liver that hundred percent control how you metabolize that. And according to my 23 and me for whatever it's worth, um, I'm a slow metabolizer of caffeine. So, um, it does, it takes a while for it to leave my body, but yet I still do get deep sleep at night and I still do have uh, fairly high HRV. So, um, you know, but then again, I'm not, I don't, I don't rely on it. I don't need it That's more exactly. than just like a cup in the morning. And, and I, and I, and I have like been following that at least an hour and a half. I try to go two hours after I wake up before that first cup. So. Yeah, exactly. And, and, being a slow metabolizer, you know, not to get into that second and third cup of coffee because it is going to screw you over for the rest of the day. So yeah, it's uh, so good. Oh. Aware, it'll make it, I know the taste is great. So yeah, a little bit in the morning, if you're in a good state is a great, great place to be for sure. As a new nootropic, for sure. No question. Yeah. Oh, and Navaz, like I could, I have so many more questions. We could talk for at least another hour, but uh, I know we got things to do. We got, we got place to be, we got people to help. So, um, you know, I, I, I'm so interested in this. I, I actually would love to read your book. I'm sure anybody listening to this must also want to read your book, learn more about you, maybe even work with you. Where would you send people to buy your book, to learn more about you online? You can find it on Amazon. It's probably the easiest place to grab it. Um, it's called Activate Your Vagus Nerve. You can find out more about me and the clinic at healthupgraded.com. And uh, there's some really cool stuff coming out over the next little bit. So I'd be more than honored to get back on the show with you and share some really cool tools that are coming out over the next couple of years. Yeah, definitely. Let's get you back. Let's uh, let's get more into this stuff and uh, and, and chat for sure. This was this was awesome. Uh, Navaz, thank you so much again for joining me today. Listener, viewer, be sure to check out Navaz's book. Check it out on Amazon. Check out his site. If you enjoyed the podcast, please remember to subscribe. Head on over to Apple Podcasts, leave the podcast a five star review. And if you're new here. Take a little gander, take some time, go through the old Holistic Nootropics archive. You'll find plenty of awesome interviews just like this, all kinds of great content, product reviews. And for more on all things biohacking, nootropics, nutrition, supplementation, head on over to holisticnootropics.com. Until next time, everybody, peace. Thanks for listening. For more brain-boosting info, in-depth articles, and show notes, check out holisticnootropics.com.